The moment is here, you can stop your search. It's Comics by Perch. Hey everybody, this is Perch. Um, all right, I, I, I love emails like this one. Um, it's, just, it's just the bluntness of it. Uh, I, I like that. It says, uh, hey Perch. Sorry to hear your show's going away. I don't know why you just don't kick that mumbles asshole out on his out on his ass so you can enjoy the channel again, but you do you, man. Okay. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, the mail goes, uh, I'm curious why you think so many comic writers feel compelled to broadcast their fetishes on the pages of comics. In what other industry does this really appear in where writers of the content are perfectly willing to expose many things, some of which criminal in nature, some which are criminal in nature, in a medium where they seem to be proud of displaying thoroughly abhorrent personal fetishes that they have. I'm t- See, I, I love the bluntness of this mail. How can you not, right? Uh-huh. I'm looking at you, Jeremy Whitley, my God, if you're not on an FBI list at this point, I don't know what's wrong with this country. But seriously, do you know of any other industry where, where the creators are so willing to publicly promote the various deviant slash criminal things they're into? Asking for a friend. <laughs> okay. I don't know why that mail just makes me laugh. Um, all right. Um, so I, there's a meme that uh, goes around from time to time or a screenshot. I believe it's from uh, Naked Gun or, uh, poli- uh, you know, yeah. It, and it's the right, this episode, the writer is fairly described fetish or barely concealed fetish. See, I screwed it all. You've, you've probably seen this before. Um, you know, they say write what you know. And uh, that that is uh, that is what you get in a lot of mediums. I mean, you, you do see some of this show up in other places. The difference is comics is relatively cheap to get into. So if you think about uh, TV or you think about, you know, movies uh, or even music, the cost to play is a lot higher. You know, a writer can write a script that is batshit insane, but then it's got to get like picked up by somebody. You got to hire actors. You got to do a film. You got to do a shoot. I mean, it's just it's a lot more expensive. And generally through that process, crazy nonsense gets filtered out. It doesn't, uh, it, it just doesn't, you know, it, it rarely makes it to air because somebody goes, hey, um, you know, this, this, uh, this, this episode is, is way t- like, this is, we're not going to put on an episode featuring this kind of stuff. It's why you do not have, um, uh, you know, I, I think what Jeremy Whitley did, the uh, asexual um, Gwynpool. And this was a this was a big deal for roughly 42 minutes where an article got written somewhere on Marvel.com that nobody reads. Like, like, here's the thing. I'm not saying, you know, you ignore it all, but I am saying if you look at the SEO and the traffic of some of these pages, it's terrible. Like, look, go go look at a Marvel com, Marvel.com article, not Marvel.com, the article and just look at the, the, the website traffic. It's abysmal. The you know top ten superheroes uh, that we like to see on DC, uh, you know HBO Max next by CBR gets much higher traffic than articles on Marvel.com. Whoever's run their website has never heard of SEO. Apparently, doesn't do anything to, with it, and uh, screw it. I mean, they just, they don't seem to care. So, I mean, it, you know, the impact of this stuff is small. So when you see an article. An interview with Jeremy Whitley talking about, um, you know, a Gwynpool is now ace, and this is like a super proud moment for me, and and all the rest. And I think uh, what Alana Smith also weighed in on that thing. Um, nobody is reading this, except you know people who are looking for content for YouTube. Now, now again, don't get me wrong. I say things like this, and people show up in the comments like, oh, "Birch is saying we shouldn't care." That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying nobody cares. You, you're certainly welcome to care. It's just, this is almost the punchline to the joke is this stuff is making everybody crazy and like no nobody in the mainstream is paying attention to it. I mean, the, the, the weird part, like uh, 
you know, not that this is ever a strategy a publisher would want to pursue, but the people who are paying the closest attention to comics right now are hypercritical of comics. And so if you're a publisher, you might want to go, I mean, screw it. If we're, if we're going, if the ship's going down, and by the way, San Diego Comic-Con coming up in a couple of weeks, and uh, it is, I, I mean, I, I, like, you never want to make these predictions. And then for all I know, this video will air after San Diego Comic-Con, probably will. But um, I, I predict that there's, like, there's going to be some very unfortunate things that are going to be happening at Barcon. Like, you never want to predict, you know, or personal harm slash tragedy. But if it was going to happen, this, this San Diego Comic-Con is going to be the one. Like, uh, if there's a heat wave uh, that hits San Diego, you're going to see people dehydrated and have many strokes that they like. Yeah, yeah anyway, or worse. I, I'm predicting some bad things are going to happen, whether you hear about it or not, because the industry is desperate. I mean, Valiant Comics is done, and nobody's even reporting on it. You have a lot of stuff happening that just is ugly, I think, going on in, in comics right now. Uh, but, the, but the point of all this is, it, like, if, if you were in this industry, if you were a publisher, it wouldn't be the dumbest idea in the world to go, hey, you know what? We're, we're we, like, things aren't great. You know, we're just going to play to the hypercritical audience for a while because, fuck, at least we know they're paying attention. That's the folly a lot of this stuff. I mean, the, this Gwynpool uh, thing where she came out as asexual was a short story in the Marvel Voices Pride and then a uh, like a, a Marvel Now digital only one shot issue. Like, if, if you, if I asked all of you to like, hey, you know, you're, you're going to need to write a comic that nobody will pay attention to, published by Marvel, that's, that's the approach you would take. You would do exactly this because nobody's going to read it. I, I mean, it's, it's more people are going in and out of a Target or a Walmart in your local big city than are reading this comic or anything to do with any of this. So, so anyway, but the, the point is, um, comics, it's just an easier bar of entry to write whatever crazy ass thing you're into. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, that's, that's how a lot of the writing shows up. When you read it, you're reading what's relevant to the writer. And whether it's a fetish or not, whether it's just dialogue and what people find interesting, I mean, you know, when you get these comics of the, uh, of the, you know, the, the creator, the the superheroes, rather the characters inside the comic eating food. You'll notice it's it's usually food that is is relevant to the writer. It's like you know somebody saw the Avengers and they're like, "What's this shawarma thing that they mentioned in the in the movie in the in credits? What is shawarma? I've never heard of that before." And so the writer goes and gets some some cheap shawarma somewhere in New York, and suddenly like that's the food that all the superheroes are eating. If this is going to be this is a weird point to make, but you notice a lot of superheroes are not like, "Hey, I got a pizza." It's it's always some bizarre ass thing that the writer is particularly enamored with. It's uh, you know I I there was um I forget Marvel did a, uh, a like a private dinner for some of the writers, and they had like a tasting menu where they had multiple small courses. Uh, if you if you have ever sat for a tasting, you're usually pretty good. You usually get to experience some amazing food. I always uh, slightly despise those because they tend to go for like three hours. And if you want to, you, you know, if you want to extract my version of hell, it's, uh, you know, sit down for dinner for three to four hours. I, I will claw my way out of that table and situation. Now, if, if we're sitting around drinking, it's a different story. But if 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 you're talking about a dinner that's going to get teased out over three to four hours, fuck me. No, absolutely not. But, you know, but anyway, Marvel did this dinner and they had all these kind of fancy food. Somebody had sent me a photo of the menu. I'll try and dig it up, put it in this video, or I'll forget. Um, but, you know, in, in like four months after, five months after, in the comic book, suddenly you get like the X-Men having a tasting menu and you get these, these elaborate things that are in the comic. What you're seeing is the writer's life. And I think the shift that, that has happened a little bit in comics is that once upon a time, the goal of the comic was to put the focus on the character in the comic or the atmosphere, the environment of the comic. You know, as Spider-Man's in New York, we're going to focus on Spider-Man. We don't try and retrofit in whatever the fuck is going on with the writer into Spider-Man's life. And that's what you're getting now. Interactions used to be somewhat homogenous in the sense that 
you know, they wanted to make sure that whatever the character was doing, whatever, you know, hey, we're going out to a movie. They wanted it relatable to the masses. Whether you live in New York or you live in Los Angeles or you live in, you know, Kansas City or you live in Cody, Wyoming or wherever you happen to be in your life, that's where they wanted the comic to feel like that, like at least feel true. And I remember very clearly, uh, you know, very old uh, interview with, with Mark Grunwald talking about when he wrote about New York, he wanted to make sure that if you were, if you had never been to New York in your life, if you lived in El Paso, Texas, that you could pick up the comic and it would still feel like New York to you based on what you perceived New York was like. You didn't want to make it ultra specific. He didn't want to make it about himself and his personal life. He wanted to try and make it relatable to as many people as possible. And somewhere along the line, that changed. And, and really probably about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and Ben does still a lot of it, so maybe he's all to blame or he's patient here. But you started to see writers for mainstream comics become more about their life and the characters of the superheroes are just kind of chewboard into it. And so, yeah, you get some really awkward comics. I'll tell you, when uh, comic writers do a YA book or a, a comic that features kids, and the kids are uh, talking, you know, about their sexuality or, or anything like that. It often feels creepy to me. It, it does not feel like it's, uh, you know, the writer trying to include representation. It includes it's kind of the writer, you know, basically exposing something they're into. It, it just, I, I, it, that's just, it just lands strange to me every time um, or not every time. But now I can go back and I can read old issues of Power Pack. And in that comic, you've got kids, you know, they are children. They're all preteen or pre, pre adolescence anyway. And you have things like they're changing into their costumes. And you don't feel weird or skeezy reading this because the, the kids feel like kids. They, they feel, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have anything more to it. But today, I mean, it, it feels like this isn't something you should be watching or reading or including your collection. It does feel weird. There's a different tone. Now, I don't deny there's been a lot of additional media attention and everything else. So part of the problem is me, meaning I'm more attuned to it than I was back in the 80s. But the writing has also shifted. It were, the, the nice part about this kind of homogenous, this can appeal to anyone approach is that you didn't get this creepy feeling. I, well, put this, I'll put it this way. Um, when Chris Claremont and Jim Lee did the issue of X-Men where Rogue was in the Savage Land and she's in kind of a torn up jungle costume and hanging out with Magneto, um, you got the feeling that that Jim Lee, when you would draw kind of Rogue Chris splashing out of the water and that kind of stuff, you got the feeling it was fan service. You didn't get the feeling like Jim Lee was drawing this page and then like masturbating to the artist table because he really wishes he was in that page with Rogue. You didn't get that feeling. You didn't get the feeling like when Chris Claremont was writing issues of Kitty Pride that, uh, you know, having a relationship with Colossus, that he wasn't like, ah, oh, man, in my fantasy, I am Colossus and Kitty Pride. You didn't get that feeling from that book. Uh, today, yeah, you, you, you know, some of those comics read that way. It does, it does feel like, like when, you know, when you're reading kind of Rogue and Gambit and they've, like, got a cat, and Gamut's like, you, you get the feeling like the writer of that kind of would like to, you know, wishes that uh, she was rogue and Gambit uh, was, you know, was waiting on her every need. It, it, it's become more about the creator and the writer. I think there is some truth to that. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate. I don't know. Uh, this is my opinion. You ask the question. That's that's my opinion. Do you feel this way or am I neurotic or both could be true? You know, they're not mutually exclusive. Anyway, let me know in the comments below. And thanks for listening.